following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. Then it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize uh, our, uh, our marijuana To the agony of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs> you by the National Cannabis Coalition. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. I... Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Oh yeah, good day Tokers and Tokets and welcome. It is Thursday, June 28, 2012 and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world and it's always 420 here at Rolla J Studios in beautiful Potland, Oregon. we got a full studio today. Let's get around to the introduction starting with my right. We've got Wiz Coleco hanging out in the chair there. How are you doing Coleco? Uh-huh. Doing quite well, man. Glad to be here. Glad to see you here. We had a good Irie Island hour last night. We did. It was quite Irie and we celebrated the 420 for uh, Tonga, Samoa and uh, New Zealand. Last I night. know. <laughs> It was nice to find that out, wasn't it? Yes. We've also got Ganja John hanging out in the engineer chair as usual. What's up, Russ? How are you? Ah, oh, just ready to dish a little science and break it down for everybody it's out there. It's not 420 for me, by the way. It's, it's not. always oh, 710. It's always 710 video. for Ganja John. He's about uh, uh, 68% more than us. Yes. See, that's, that's, a, that's a guess on 710 and 420, but yeah. someone's going to have to do the math for me. <laughs> also joining us from the virtual studio in Grafstoria, Oregon, we have our news director, Carrie Gallagher. Hello, Carrie. Hello, I am not doing the math for you. <laughs> what? You can't handle I'm math. Like Barbie, math is hard. <laughs> math is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie brings us the news headlines, uh, the daily news headlines in our daily cannabis chronicle right after the first break. So, what's in the news today? Well, today we've got uh, some news about the face eater. We've mm. got to talk about him. Also, uh, I love the way that they are uh, pushing forward Amendment 64 in Colorado. I'm going to talk to you about their uh, latest strategies. And also, we've got another celebrity bus. We're going to talk about that coming up on uh, today's Cannabis Chronicles. All right. Looking forward to it. Also, we've got a discussion today. Well, first, we're going to get to our daily toker tune at 20 after. That's uh, We're going to bring you some video from the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup in the Bay Area. I've got two songs from Dell the Funky Homo Sapien that we recorded live from the Smoky Crowd, so you get to check that out. And then at the bottom of the hour, we're going to visit with Sam Chapman from Oregon SSDP. How you doing, Sam? Good to see you here today. Good. Thanks for having me, Russ. All right. We are in the last uh, minutes of uh, getting the uh, legalization signatures here in the state of Oregon. So Sam is going to talk about that and their uh, volunteer thing they've got going on this weekend. So uh, or actually, it's uh, what is that taking this place? This afternoon. This afternoon. That's right. <laughs> Not this weekend. If you go this weekend, they won't be there. Well, we'll be going all week uh, up until next week's deadline, but we are having a big event tonight at uh, the Portland's popular last Thursday event at the Alberta Street Fair. All right, so we'll check that out and talk more about that with uh, Sam Chapman. And then at the end of the show, we'll have time for a radical rant. I'm going to give you a look at Texas politics. We've covered a couple of the Democratic primaries where the Democratic challenger who was uh, better on our issue won the primary. We're going to take a look at Harris County, Texas, where in Republican primary, being tough on drugs won the race, but it may not win the the war for the uh, guy who won his position, he's finding that Texas jurors are much more reluctant to convict on drug cases than he would like. All of that, plus we'll take the discussion into hour two and take your phone calls at 971-533-7111. All that's coming up here on National Cannabis Radio and the Russ Belleville Show. Thanks for joining us. You can follow us at RadicalRuss.com. That's where my uh, show's blog is. You can get all the latest updates, the archives for all of the saved YouTube shows and the podcast downloads. Also follow Radical Russ on Twitter and NCR420 on Twitter for all the latest updates. We'll bring you back with the news and Carrie Gallagher right after this. Stick around. It's the Russ Belleville Show.
You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Uh, I have a package here for Radical Rick. Is there a Radical Rick here? How about a Rick Russ? Any any Rick Russ? Somebody named Freddie Barack has sent him a package. Anybody? What is that? It smells like a skunk. Help us legalize it. Text NCC to 42420 and send 10 bucks to the National Cannabis Coalition. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, ganja sacrament, consumer cannabis. The topic of marijuana is heating up the news, and the Russ Belleville Show catches you up with today's latest headlines. Now, here's our senior news editor, Cannabis Carey, with the Daily Cannabis Chronicle. This story was one media sensation last month. A Florida man viciously attacked a homeless man by the side of a freeway and in front of witnesses. Much was made about the completely naked man reportedly growling like a wild animal and ripping the flesh off of the victim's face with his teeth, not stopping until several bullets from police killed him. Initial reports were that the man was high on a new class of designer drugs made to mimic more traditional street drugs. We have many stories about what they call synthetic marijuana called Spice or K2, but this time they blamed the bizarre attack by Rudy Eugene on June 6th from him taking what is marketed as bath salts but made to be sold as a type of synthetic cocaine. Now, that rumor is now traced to a Miami police union official who on that day suggested that Eugene was probably under the influence of bath salts. Lab results out today to tell us that the face-eating attacker only had traditional marijuana in his system, according to the Florida Medical Examiner. Now, this rules out other street drugs that were speculated Eugene might have taken before the attack. Experts in textology testing said that marijuana alone was unlikely to cause such strange behavior but the problem is, is that there are potentially an infinite number of chemical substances that can trigger unusual behavior. The medical examiner's office in Miami is known nationwide for doing thorough work, but it is now nearly impossible for toxolo toxology testing to keep pace with new formulations of synthetic drugs. Some of the new drugs that are being introduced to vendors in America every month have no metho methodology to test on. And for a, to a toxicology lab to develop tests for every new chemical would be very difficult and very expensive. According to Dr. Bruce Goldberg, professor and director of toxology at the University of Florida, there is just not one particular test or a combination of tests that can detect every possible substance out there. The Miami-Dade County Medical Examiner said in a news release that the toxology did detect marijuana, but it didn't find any other street drugs, alcohol, or prescription drugs. He also tested negative for adulterants that are commonly mixed with street drugs. A second lab confirmed the absence of basalt, synthetic marijuana, and LSD. So the lab results didn't give anyone an answer to why Eugene attacked and seriously disfigured 65-year-old Ronald Popo. His family, who are not suing the police for his death, say that he had never been violent, he didn't drink, and he was known to not do any drugs harder than marijuana. Well, we all know that uh, pot zombies can't be responsible for face eating because there's only one thing pot zombies are after, and that's strains, strains. All right, look, let's uh, let's debunk some of this stuff. First of all, this whole case, you know, they're trying to make a big deal of, oh, the only thing we found in the system was pot. It was just pot. Well, guess what that proves? It proves that crazy people smoke pot, too. 
<laughs> Look, when we've got 11.2% of the American population that is smoking marijuana annually and six, some, some 6% that are smoking it uh, monthly, it's highly likely that some of them will be mentally unbalanced. What this shows us is a severe deficit we have in our mental health screening and mental health treatment in this country. It's not some sort of indictment on super pot that's going to somehow make people go crazy. The reason people want to pin this on pot or bath salt or LSD or anything like that is because people, you know, human Humans by nature, we don't like the unexplainable. And, and it's really disturbing to us when there's violence and when there's such a horrific violence like this. I mean, a guy naked on the streets, you know, crouching over someone, stripping them down and eating their face is pretty horrific. And we want to be able to pin that on an explanation, something solid, some reason that could explain what's going on here with this craziness. And the fact is, sometimes people just go mad. Sometimes this just happens and you can't pin it on one particular thing other than perhaps their mental illness. It's not any one simple formula that says if you smoke pot or use bath salt or take LSD, you suddenly become a criminal because if that were the case, we'd have much higher crime rates than we have right now. The excellent Maya Salovitz out at Time Magazine at the Time Healthland site, you can find it at healthland.time.com, has, has tackled most of this stuff. Uh, one, one way they tried to bring this up that it was such a big problem with drug-related crimes is in the 1990s, during the Giuliani era, they looked at murders in, the New, in New York City and found that they had the peak of their murders in 1988 during the peak of the so-called crack epidemic, right? And in that, that time, about three quarters of the people arrested in New York were testing positive for cocaine. However, when they actually looked into the numbers, they found that 7.5% of the killings that occurred in 1990 between March and October involved people who had taken drugs, and in most cases, the drug was alcohol. There was just five cases, five cases out of these 414 killings, less than 1% there, about 1%, involved people who had smoked crack. And only about 2% involved people who committed their crimes to get drug money. And 40% of the slangs involved drug trade disputes, the kind of disputes that would go away in a regulated drug market. So whenever you hear these stats about drugs and crime, realize that they're going in there with a perception bias. They want to find something bad about drugs and they want to be able to pin it on violence and crime. And when you look at this, when you really start to take a look at, at some of this stuff, you understand that we have what's called a, a, a clinician's error. You know, um, imagine, and, and Maya Salovitz puts this you know, perfectly. She says, imagine if you grew up in a place where no one drank alcohol and then you went to work in an emergency room where your only exposure to the effects of booze was overdosed college kids, victims of drunk driving accidents, and patients with severe liver disease. You'd probably view all drinking as extremely risky because you'd have no exposure to the majority of people who drink moderately and never wind up in the hospital. And the same type of error that doctors can make is made by rehab people, is made by police officers, and is made by journalists. By the nature of their jobs, they are only interfacing with the people who have problems Problems with drugs. They're not interfacing with me and Coleco and John and the other people we know who use marijuana or may use other substances and don't cause any problems that need to be reported in the papers or need to be hauled into the police office for. That's why they don't see and they can't believe that there is such a thing as responsible use of drugs, that not all use is abuse. This face-eating zombie story is just the latest example of this, and we're going to keep debunking that right here at National Cannabis Radio. We've certainly been here before, Russ. High-profile celebrities who base some of their identity with cannabis culture then getting in legal trouble for having marijuana. Now, the latest and certainly no stranger to marijuana charges is Snoop Dogg. Snoop was on a tour in Europe when he was detained early this morning in Norway at the airport by airport security as he traveled through Christiansand, Norway. Custom officials, that's where he's doing a concert, custom officials doing a routine baggage check found eight grams of marijuana tucked away in his luggage. But thankfully, the cannabis laws in Norway are lenient if you are caught with less than 15 grams, so he was heavily fined instead. Snoop had to pay 12,000 Norwegian krone, or about $2,000 U.S. money, Norway officials say that Snoop was extremely cooperative, considerate, and quickly paid his fine and was on to his next stop. Tomorrow night he plays in France and on to Switzerland, Rome, the UK, Ireland, Finland before heading to Canada to play a series of shows starting July 10th. Now, if you happen to attend a concert and get backstage, you might want to kick down to Snoop. He probably can't travel with it anymore. Man, I bet Snoop gets to smoke in all kinds of cool exotic places.
It's not fair. It ain't right, man. And <laughs> at eight grams, you probably got eight grams in your belly button right now. That's probably true. <laughs> belly button land on Ganja John. Uh, you know, look, busting Snoop Dogg for weed, this is shooting fish in a barrel. We all know it. And I think anymore that there should just be a special passport for Snoop Dogg. There should just be a special pass where when he, uh, when he arrives in your state, whatever the fine is for possession of marijuana, he just pays it up front. Snoop comes into your state, lays down six bills, whatever it is, and then you leave Snoop alone, okay? Can we just leave Snoop Dogg alone? Are we really worried that he's out there trying to distribute marijuana, that he's trying to deal in any sort of way? No, no, he's, he's just a rapper. He's just a, an artist who is known for his marijuana use. And and really, that's the problem they have with him, is that he pre he presents this this image of someone who's, you know, gone through some trials and tribulations in his life, but turned things around, become a father and a, and a family man and a successful businessman and, and expanded his media empire beyond just rapping into what, clothing and sports and all sorts of stuff. Uh, that's what they don't like. They don't like the positive image of someone who is an unashamed marijuana su su supporter, and that's why they keep going after Snoop Dogg. I tell you, this has just got to stop and it's never Never going to stop, you know, until we legalize for and, everyone. And Russ, real quickly, I did want to add, this is sort of an update to this story, but I did want to add that Wiz Khalifa, that who I was very concerned with, made it through his June 24th Dubai concert without being arrested. He's uh, back stateside. Just wanted to add that. Oh, made it out of Dubai where the British <laughs> yeah. sentence, Coleco? That's right. Yeah, could have faced death. Good Lord. Yeah, they just had a death sentence for death. three quarters of an ounce. We talked about that on yesterday's show as well. And again, even though we're with National Cannabis Radio, we'll keep you informed on what's going on the international scene as well. Now, the push for legaliz the legalization effort has been most successful so far in the state of Colorado, where they are working to pass Amendment 64, the Regulate Marijuana-Like Alcohol Act. The citizen initiative has already made the ballot, so voters in the state will get to vote on a constitutional amendment to legalize the use of cannabis by adults in the state. Now, once the campaign made the ballot, the Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol group behind the effort has been spending their time and money on running a clean campaign and working to send the message that legalization of marijuana is good for Colorado kids as well as adults. Now, they first used their post-signature gathering budget to erect a billboard right in the heart of downtown Denver near the famed Mile High Stadium. It featured a soccer mom type woman with the caption, for many reasons, I prefer marijuana over alcohol. Does that make me a bad person? Now, today they unveiled another billboard at the same location, 1600 Federal Boulevard in Denver. This time, the message was to parents. It shows a dad with his arm around his teenage son, and this time the caption reads, Please card my son. Now, a, subhater, a subheader underneath says, Regulate the sale of marijuana and help me keep it out of his hands. Now, a Denver school psychologist who chairs an organization called Moms and Dads for Marijuana Regulation said that the current marijuana policy is the worst for keeping marijuana out of the hands of teenagers. Dr. Erica Joy makes it the point by allowing the sale of marijuana to be kept in the black market, our kids are exposed to more harmful products. Amendment 64 would allow marijuana sales to be conducted in a regulated market with strict controls over carding purchasers and taping transactions. There is a no on 64 group called Smart Colorado, and that includes Well County District Attorney Ken Buck, who predicts that if Amendment 64 passes, that Colorado would see a proliferation of marijuana use among teens. And he also argues that the expulsion rates and the dropout rates would increase in the K-12 through public school system. Well, all right. Great billboard. We showed the picture of that. Uh, we'll put it back up here so you can take a look at it. Um, Ken Buck, though, that name sounds familiar, and I think I'm recollecting it from my uh, work in uh, LGBT activism. Isn't he the guy that said that uh, being gay was like being an alcoholic, something like that, Coleco? Yeah, he basically said, you know, it was a choice. It was a choice. The being gay is a choice, kind of like being an alcoholic. And apparently, if you go to rehab and therapy, you can be cured. Well, you know what I always think about guys like that? You know, I, uh, I'm i originally from Idaho. We, ha we had a certain Senator, Larry Craig. You might remember him. He of the wide stance. Uh, you know, I think the man doth protest too much. And to see his money being, uh, being poured into this as well, to try to uh, oppose legalization in Colorado, where the latest polls have shown 61% of people there in the Mile High State are, are in support. You're on the losing end of history, Ken. It's 420 back in Idaho where Russ and Carrie were born. So we have to go uh, connect with our roots. You know what I mean? 
please support these sponsors who support the Russ Belleville Show. All right, when we come back, it's time for our Daily Toker Tunes. We got some live video from the Medical Cannabis Cup at the Bay. Del, the funky homo sapien, with a couple of tunes for the smoky crowd. And then we got Sam Chapman from Oregon SSDP joining us. Stick around. It's the Russ Belleville Show. We're back after this. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. The Russ Belleville Show brings you the best in daily toker tunes every weekday. Each day features a different genre, including Roots Monday, Folks, here's a story about Mindy Electric Tuesday, yeah. Irie Wednesday, Summer Ganja Planta, call me the Ganja Planta, Reuben Thursday, Do you wanna get high? and Rocket Friday. Then on weekends, we mix them all together in our weekend music party. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Groovin' Thursday, featuring rap, hip-hop, soul, and funk music. You can get downloads and more information about all our daily Tucker tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your daily Tucker tunes. All right, welcome back, everybody. And uh, we are getting ready with some video here from the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup 2012. It was such a good time out there at the Craneway Pavilion, this big, beautiful hanger-like substance. <laughs> hanger-like substance? <laughs> Building, I should say. Uh, just lots and lots of glass. And we got some film of Del the Funky Homo Sapien, who opened up the uh, High Times VIP party on Saturday night. Uh, just him and an, uh, you know, another uh, uh, MC and a DJ, just, you know, the old school hip hop. It was a really, really good time. And despite the uh, venue being a non-smoking venue, I got to tell you, once they closed the doors to the general public and it was VIP, the smoke was, uh, well, there was plenty to be had. You'll see just about everybody from our crew here enjoying Dell the Funky Homo Sapien live at the Medical Cannabis Cup 2012. Enjoy. Stop, but a backstab and they want to try to beat 
straight ass up. Yo, D E L, the only franchise. What if I a landslide? You know you can't hide. Yo, put the only franchise. What if I a landslide? You know you can't hide. High road, look at the only franchise. What if I a landslide? You know you can't hide. Dell the Funky Homo Sapien from the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup 2012. What a great show. When we come back, we got Sam Chapman here from Oregon SSDP joining us. We're going to talk about legalization in Oregon. Stick around. Dear Dad, how should I say this? You know how you enjoy a drink after work? Well, in many ways, I'm just like you. I have a good job. I work hard. But when I get home, I prefer to relax with marijuana instead of alcohol. They're a little similar, but marijuana is actually less damaging to my health. And frankly, I don't feel like crap the next day. I hope this makes sense. But if not, let's talk. 
TalkItUpColorado.org. Start your conversation about marijuana. Paid for by the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol, Colorado. Attention, National Cannabis Radio listeners. If you haven't heard the political pontifications of Lively and Mr. Libra on the Libra Lounge yet, be sure to visit here Wednesday nights at 6 Pacific or visit thelibralounge.com for archives and links to download current episodes. Be a lounger. The Libra Lounge. begins with ACT. The Rush Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. All right, welcome back, everybody. 31 after the hour, and uh, we are going to talk more about my home state, the state of Oregon, the Beaver State, and we are working hard to legalize marijuana. We've had two initiatives that have been trying at this for quite some time now. The Oregon Cannabis Tax Act, also known as I-9 for Initiative 9, and the uh, Oregon Marijuana Policy Initiative, also known as I-24. Joining us to talk about the campaign and the last few days of signature gathering is Sam Chapman from the University of Oregon, Go Ducks, SSDP chapter. How you doing, Sam? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on, Russ. Oh, glad to have you here. And uh, so tell folks about what we got going on tonight. I know you and Coleco have been talking about this. Uh, Bradley Steinman was on the show last night uh, with the Irie Island Hour talking about it. What's happening here to get the last final push going here for Oregon legalization? Yeah, so essentially, I mean, we have um, between now and July 5th to turn in um, our last push of signatures for both I-9 and I-24. And um, at this point, uh, you know, it's crunch time. Um, both are very close to being on the chopping block, and there's a chance that both may not make it if we do not get uh, enough people out collecting signatures um, now. All right, so where are we at as far as the goals? What do they need to turn in for each initiative? Um, I'm pretty sure, let's see here. Um, uh, according to the Oregon Secretary of State's website, Okta has turned in 55,869 valid signatures, leaving it 31,344 short um, for the total of 87,213, which is needed. Um, Paul Stan I've been working with Paul Stanford very closely, who's the chief petitioner of Okta, and um, he has... Um, <laughs> told us that he has collected um, a lot of signatures that have yet to be turned in, um, but essentially um, we're not really looking too closely at the numbers at this point. We just need to empower people to start collecting signatures on their own. Um, and uh, that's what we're doing this afternoon. Um, All right. And the other initiative, the uh, constitutional amendment needs more signatures, I take it. Correct. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see here, finding the numbers on that. I know that one needs roughly around 117,000, and uh, they're about 50,000 short uh, at this moment. Of course, I mean, keeping in mind the validity rates that both got, that means that they both kind of got to double the number that they need. Okta needs about 30,000 valid signatures. I-24 needs about 50,000 valid signatures. So both need, uh, you know, between 60 to 100,000 signatures within the next week uh, turned into the Secretary of State's office in order to qualify. Okay. So, so Sam, this is a, a signature gathering operation uh, being done by volunteers uh, later. At, give, give everyone the time the the, where they need to be, what's happening. Yeah, so um, this afternoon we're going to be uh, going down to the last Thursday Alberta Street Fair um, and uh, we're going to split up into two teams. One team is going to start at one end on Northeast Alberta and 15th at 5 p.m. The other team will be starting at the other end of the Street Fair, which is Northeast Alberta and 30th. Um, both teams will meet at those locations at 5 p.m. and we'll quickly go over um, the nuts and bolts of what uh, people they need to know as far as signature collecting goes you know um the um the fact that if one if we get one invalid signature it discounts a lot of potentially valid signatures right um so there's a there's gonna be a lot of emphasis on that um, we're gonna train people how to really make it fun and easy and you know um give them a couple ideas for how to approach people how to talk about each initiative what each initiative uh, essentially is um is doing in a summary and uh, hopefully not only we're gonna collect signatures we're gonna collect more volunteers who can then 
can collect more signatures. All right, but given that we had uh, 52% turn-in validity with both of these using professional signature gatherers, how are we going to prevent or get you know raise those rates uh, with volunteers in a you know one-day effort like this? Yeah. You- you know, it's it's going to be really hard. Um, I mean, essentially, we're just going to have to be very clear and very straightforward with all of our volunteers. You know, you're, you, they are not professional signature gatherers. Um, and, you know, that's something that we're definitely taking into account. And we're trying to make this as easy um, as a process as we can for them. You know, one thing I would mention is this is more of a focusing event uh, to really gain momentum for the next week. I mean, obviously, we're going to go out today and try to gain signatures. We sent out a press release to all of the Oregon media to try to gain some attention and garner some support within the next week. But really, this is just the first event kicking off this week-long effort that we're trying to plan to really organize statewide without within Oregon SSDP and all of our chapters, as well as all of the marijuana community members around the state. Because we know that really, you know, the paid petitioning gathers or the signature gathers have really been focused in Portland. So what we're trying to do uh, is we're going to have this first event in Portland where a lot of people don't uh, typically hit up for signatures, which is this, uh, you know, last last Thursday on Alberta um, event. But then, you know, we're going to be trying to make this a statewide effort over the next week. So uh, really, this is just more of a focusing event than just a one day uh, blitz. Okay, okay. And we're sitting here with uh, Sam Chapman from University of Oregon SSDP. And uh, so we've got 31,000 to collect for OCTA, about 50,000 to collect for the constitutional amendment. Are your signature gatherers traveling with both initiatives to get them both signed at once? Correct, yes. Um, they uh, Both campaigns, that are, uh, all volunteers for both campaigns are carrying both um, both petitions, that's correct. And uh, so that will be a little extra training to make sure that our volunteers know both the petitions, but we think we have a formula down um, and handouts that we're going to be giving out to everyone, to not only our volunteers, but people who are just interested and want to know more about each initiative and hopefully those are um, different um, tactics that they can utilize you know and hopefully become independent that's really the goal here is to empower people to become independent on their own and then hopefully can get their friends to get involved you know it's not just enough for you know the um, the the marijuana community right now to go out and collect signatures on their own we need to be reaching out to everyone we know Um, and, you know, just showing how important this is, you know, this is really crunch time. We don't have time to, you know, talk about past history, you know, what went wrong, what we did right. Um, it's really just time to put, uh, our voices down and go out and speak with our actions. All right. And, uh, with respect to the, the, the signature gathering for both initiatives, it's something that I had criticized as the potential for confusing voters and leading to possible spoilage of votes by people who aren't keeping track. And then they might, you know, sign it twice or, you know, end up invalidating a sheet somehow. Um, and, and, and it's something that was addressed by SSDP as well. And when we had a, had a gathering on this with the proponents of three initiatives, SSDP at the time uh, unanimously decided to back the I-24, the one requiring more signatures and the one now looking like it's got less chance of making the ballot. So do you think maybe if, if, if different decision had been made to back Okta, we'd be farther ahead if everybody had coalesced around the one that had already had some momentum rather than the brand new one? No, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we definitely don't regret um, uh, initially endorsing I-24. And when we did that endorsement, we held that conference, uh, we made it very clear that we were not counting out Okta. It's not that we weren't going to stop working with Okta ever. It just made more sense, you know, as the same kind of arguments that you made, you know, mm-hmm. it was just... It, it was logical. It was pragmatic to just have one. You know, we don't want to confuse people. And at um, you know at at this point, um, we just have to kind of. Uh Put that put that aside and just you know look at what's in front of us and that's that you know we have two initiatives that um, are you know have a good chance of maybe not making the ballot if we don't bring enough people out. Um, so you know uh, we uh, as far as um, going back if we had to make another decision you know we would hope I, I personally would have still made the same decision I still would have yeah. pushed that you know. Um, it was funny. My mother got the last word in at that conference yeah. and she literally got up there and asked. Um, you know, there was talk towards the end of the conference, like, look, you know, yeah, we're willing to work with the other initiative. Yeah, let's do it, you know? And it was just people talking. And my mother got up there, and, you know, I play this in my head. I've been playing in my head for the last two weeks. And she literally just goes, gets up there and is like, look, you're in the same room right now. Why don't you work together? Um, and it was kind of just blank face, no response kind yeah. of thing. And, you know, it's... <laughs> You know that's where that's where I get my uh, my strong head from, I guess. Yeah. But um, you know, it's um, 
I, I, I wish I wish we would have been able to just run with one. It would have turned out that way. But, you know, there's a lot of events that happened in between that conference and now that we were not predictable. There's yeah. there no way. Well, that's, to... that's part of it, too, is the, is the politics of these things. And, and you can't really tell where things are going to go. And sometimes you'll make a, a, a point for your, for your side or for your uh, cause that is a perfectly valid point. But you can't predict where it's going to go from there. It's almost like, all right, we should have we all agree that it, the smart thing to do would be to have one initiative. Everybody get behind one initiative. And then you pick one, and then the people promoting initiatives say, oh, that was nice. And then they just keep going forward with their initiatives. You don't have much choice then. Then it's like, well, you can't be against an initiative. You can't be against two initiatives. You really just have to work with the hand that's dealt to you. So I saw it as SSDP saying, hey, everybody, let's get unified behind one thing. And everybody went, uh, no. (laughs) <laughs> and so, okay, well, then we'll continue to work forward with what we got. Is, is that unfair to characterize? No, that no, that's that's exactly, um, you know, my mindset. And, you know, I, I'm not, you know, you don't hear me on here um, uh, trying to bag people that didn't do what we had suggested or like, you know, things like that. You know, we're here to continue to do what we need to do, which is collect signatures. You know, we're not, um, I'm not trying to. Um, you know, bring up bad blood or like, you know, things from the past that, you know, decisions that could have been made a different way and we would have had a better outcome. You know, at this point, it's, you know, it's just uh, just speaking with actions. And this is what we've got. You know, a lot of states don't even have the ability to have initiatives. We've got two. Yep. So let's get, you know, you're right. Uh, the, we can we can learn our lessons from what happened or what decisions were made. Uh, we have plenty of time to go over those learn lessons, go forward with the next one. But right now, we are a week or less than a week from get, you know the chance to put legalization on the ballot. So forget all that. Squash that for now. Let's go forward with you know getting people on the streets, signing both of them. I, look, if you go for the goal of getting the constitutional amendment on, you got more than enough signatures to get Octa on, right? Mm-hmm. So, so having them going out and getting signatures for both is excellent. I mean, this is this is what we've got to do. And and destruction said this in the chat room as well. Uh, is that it's not a matter of how many signatures you're getting. It's that you're out getting signatures. Absolutely. It's that you're out fighting for your liberty. You know, uh, when when these ballot initiatives are proposed and say like Prop 19 uh, was proposed, made the ballot, didn't pass. It's still a victory. Just making the ballot is a victory because I always say whenever we're talking about this, we're winning. Whenever it's in front of the people and they're forced to vote on it, we're winning. So let's give people the details again. Tell them how an, an online context and anything else they need to know. Yeah, so um, the event is this uh, this afternoon at 5 p.m. We're going to be going to the last Thursday Alberta Street Fair. Right uh, after this show, get in your car and go to Alberta. Yes. It, not Canada. Alberta Street here in Portland. Northeast, yes. If you are from Alberta, Canada, you are welcome, but I don't think you'll make it by five. Sorry to interrupt. Go on. <laughs> yeah, so um, we'll be uh, at uh, the Alberta Street uh, last Thursday Street Fair, and um, at 5 p.m. we will have two locations in which you can go to. You know, just just pick one. It doesn't really matter. Whatever's closest to you. Either Northeast Alberta and 15th or Northeast Alberta and 30th. And the idea is that each team will get there and meet at 5 p.m. They will convene and um, brief all the volunteers on what they need to uh, know as far as collecting signatures. We'll get them sheets, we'll get them clipboards, we'll get them pens, we'll give them handouts on things to say. Um, We're gonna make it as easy as possible for you to help us out here. And uh, so yeah, just come down, um, 5 p.m. last Thursday, Alberta Street Fair. And um, you know, it's time to uh, put legalization on the ballot here in Oregon. I was just going to say, if you need directions and you don't know where those Alberta streets are, go to lastthursdayonalberta.com to find out directions from there if you're anywhere in the Portland metro area. All right. Thanks, guys. Love the student activism and getting the feet on the streets for legalization. When we come back, we'll have time for a little radical ranting. Going to take a trip to Texas and show you how politics works on the Republican side of the primaries. It's the Russ Bell Show on National Cannabis Radio. Stick around. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Brought to you by the National Cannabis Coalition. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. Marijuana and 
alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana smoking is non-toxic, relatively safe, and has a low risk of dependence. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tvert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit MarijuanaIsSafer.com. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Friends, it's time we legalize the responsible use of marijuana and stop treating marijuana smokers like criminals. We're destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of good, hardworking Americans every year in this country for no good reason. There's absolutely nothing wrong with smoking pot. For more information on how you can help legalize marijuana, please contact Normal at norml.org. I have to say that there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high, uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. I don't know what this says about the online audience, but <laughs> uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. So. Nearly one million lives wrecked by a marijuana arrest every year, Mr. President. Politely tell President Obama what you think about legalization by calling the White House at 202-456-1111. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. All right, folks, I'm going to take you on a trip down to Texas because we've been doing a lot of reporting on the primaries and how the marijuana issue or the drug issue, I guess you could say, has affected the primary races, uh, particularly in Oregon and Texas. We brought you the story of uh, Ellen Rosenblum, the uh, the attorney general candidate who won her campaign uh, in here, uh, right up here in Oregon against Dwight Holton, who was this uh, this very anti-medical marijuana candidate. We brought you the story of Sylvester Reyes, who's the uh, U.S. congressman who lost his seat to Beto O'Rourke, who uh, he tried to characterize as being uh, soft on drugs and uh, the uh, the people of the uh, district there voted him out. But now I want to take you to Texas, and particularly Harris County, Texas, where uh, Patricia Light was the DA there, uh, and she just lost her Republican primary to a challenger, Mike Anderson, a former judge, uh, who ran against her as being, again, soft on drugs. But the change here, being just uh, being on the Republican side, is that he won his race by being tough on drugs. Now, if the name Pat Lycos rings a bell, you may have, if you followed my career and you saw me at the Baker Institute, where I was a part of this seminar entitled The War on Drugs Has Failed, Is Legalization the Answer? And there, I witnessed this presentation by uh, Patricia Lycos, the Honorable Pat Lycos, who's the uh, District Attorney of Harris County. Uh, also, there was a Harris County judge there, an assistant police chief from Houston and a speaker from LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Now, Lycos is a very dynamic speaker uh, with whom I disagreed on just about every point she made except one. She was talking about uh, the case of what they call trace cases in the judicial system where the courts are clogged by these cases of people getting uh, busted with a crack pipe or a fleck of cocaine on their no uh, on their nose. These r tiny, minute residues of drugs uh, that are clogging the court cases. Uh, this is Pat, a video of Pat Lycos from Baker Institute. Check this out because it'll give you an idea uh, what she was, uh, what kind of a legislator she was here. Good morning. I'm Pat Likas, your district attorney. 
and with respect to the uh, trace policy that our moderator uh, mentioned, when I first took office, I met with our chief prosecutors, the hardest nosed one. I said, how do we improve the system? And number one on their list was dealing with trace cases. Now, I made a decision years ago never to learn the metric system. <laughs> I think it's un-American. <laughs> I don't care how many kilometers an hour your car goes, all right? But the drug trade has compelled me to learn a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a gram, okay? Now, we were prosecuting people for state jail felonies for trace cases. Sometimes they had a little flake extruding from, mucus extruding from their nose, a little flake here, maybe a little residue in a crack pipe. So we began research, and we discovered the minimum amount that can be tested twice, due process, state and defense, right? It's one one hundred of this. Okay? She's holding a Splenda packet, by the way, for those of you listening of those on the uh, podcast. Clogging up our dockets, thousands of people in jail, overcrowding the jail. Okay. So then we did further research. Bear County, San Antonio, their minimum threshold is one one hundredth of a gram. Travis County, Austin, I know they're weird, but <laughs> one one hundredth of a gram. Tarrant County is double that, two one-hundredths of a gram. So then we put together this policy. We met with the command staff of the Houston Police Department. We met the same with the Sheriff's Office. We met with our Harris County Criminal Justice Council and laid it all out. There were no objections. The only thing that HPD asked is that we do a study in six months to see the effect. I want you all to understand that when someone is arrested for a trace case, that officer is out of service two to three hours. That neighborhood is unprotected for two to three hours. And with your overcrowded jail and your overcrowded docket. So I told the law enforcement officers, I want you to arrest the, the drug dealer and the person who supplied the drug, drug dealer and the person who supplied that and the bulk cash couriers and so forth. I want you to work your way all the way up there and cut the head off the snake, okay? because these are transnational criminal organizations that are involved. Now, I know you all think I'm all warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to stop and think of the effect on especially young people to have a record for a state jail felony. They'll be unemployable, unable to get certain licenses and so forth, okay? In addition to that, you talk about surreal. First offense burglary of a motor vehicle is a misdemeanor, and a trace is a state jail felony. Okay? So officers are getting time and a half to fight the drug war, and this is their drug war arrest, time and a half to go to court. So the union bosses are not happy with me. So that was uh, Honorable Pat Lycos at the uh, Baker Institute when she was making that presentation. And she's absolutely right on this trace case. You know, we're just clogging up our system with these, you know, one one hundredth of a gram and people that steal a car are getting a misdemeanor. However, her challenger in that Republican primary was a retired judge named Mike Anderson who repeatedly attacked her on this trace case issue, as well as another program she had instituted called Divert. Uh, it was a program for drunk driving offenders. It basically reduced the penalties uh, for drunk driving, uh, to just a, uh, a, a deferrable, I'll, I'll find the, I'll find the, uh, the exact term for it, but a deferrable adjudication basically means, uh, you plead guilty, but you're not found guilty. And if you, if you're good for a certain amount of time, that is never considered a conviction. The arrest still exists, but you, you're not convicted. And, uh, what this has done, a deferred adjudication is what it's called. And, uh, by reducing the p penalties for the minute amounts of Coke and meth and this divert program for DUIs, uh, Lycos had lowered the jail population by a thousand inmates 
and freed up resources for more severe and serious crimes, freed up all those officers' times. The two of them were on a public television debate in Houston, which included the surprising badgering of Anderson from the right-wing host uh, about Anderson's seeming acceptance of this trace case presentation that Lycos had made to law enforcement just a month prior to being at the Baker Institute. So at the time she... Out, uh, rolled out this program, uh, Mike Anderson didn't seem to have much of a problem with it, but as soon as he was running against her, he made it his uh, tough-on-drugs issue. Now, Judge Anderson did win that primary, and he said, quote, not prosecuting these trace cases is against the law, and if you don't like the law, change it. Now, that's quotes according to the Harris County Conservative Politics blog. Uh, the, also, uh, change is is change it by going to Austin and getting new legislation passed. The district attorney does not have the right to legislate. Since this program has been in effect, 596 fewer drug delivery arrests have been made. Now, the reason I bring this all up, I mean, it's not really news that a Republican's going to win a primary by trying to appear tough on drugs or scaremongering around the drug issue. The reason I bring it up is because this Republican DA might find himself in a situation where it's going to be tougher and tougher for him to impanel a jury to convict people for one one hundredth of a gram. This is a story I got uh, thanks to Jen Alexander from A Different View. Uh, she forwarded this to me from KTRK TV in Houston. Israel Wrangle was charged with possession of less than a gram of cocaine. Cops said he had half as much coke as there is in a sweet and low packet. During jury selection, 50 out of 130 jurors said nope, they would not convict someone even if it was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. One of the juror was one of the jurors was more blunt than the others. She said, quote, I can't believe I had to get in my car and come down here for this, end quote, according to the defense attorney, Todd DuPont. And uh, ass Assistant District Attorney Julian Ramirez said, quote, it says there is a segment of the population that doesn't think small possession cases should be punished as severely as the law calls for them to be. So. Folks, this isn't even a trace case we're talking about. This is a guy caught with half a gram of cocaine and 38% of potential Texas jurors in conservative Harris County won't even convict on it. Even if you got videotape of the deal and a packet of cocaine in the guy's hand, they are not going to come back with a guilty verdict. And this is the power of the juries we've been talking about. Oh, and by the way, about that divert program, that whole first time DUI thing that uh, Judge uh, Anderson was saying, oh, she's letting all the drunk drivers. Well, this goes back to some more politics. I want to thank Big Jolly Politics for bringing this one up. It seems back in 2000, Judge Anderson presided over a DUI case for a very prominent conservative Houston uh, uh, conservative funder, basically funds all these PACs, these super PACs. He got arrested for a DUI back in 2000. Uh, he always says that his objections to, to things like drugs are rooted in Bible-based conservative Christian philosophy, yet the guy's busted at 1.30 in the morning, leaving a dinner party that was being held for patrons of a cigar store. So I guess if the drugs are tobacco and alcohol, there's nothing Bible-based and conservative we have to worry about there. But in February of 2001, this guy, the conservative guy, the funder, his DUI case just disappeared. There was a problem with the evidence, with the testimony of a cop, and he got off of his DUI. Fast forward to 2012, this guy's raising PAC money for the Anderson campaign, campaigning against Lycos by releasing these mailers that say what an awful person she is for the divert program, that all these DUI offenders and the DUI fatalities have gone up, yet this guy was busted for a DUI himself and got off scot-free. That's the kind of rank Republican hypocrisy we find in Harris County, Texas, and we find all throughout politics when we talk about the issues of drugs, alcohol, and marijuana. We're going to keep their feet to the fire and keep bringing you the break it down knowledge here on National Cannabis Radio. They're not going to get away with it. Stick around for hour two. We got more on this story this coming up. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. All right, for Wiz Coleco, Ganja John, Sam Chapman, and Cannabis Carry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for hour two. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. I am not guilty.
out there 